<clears throat> hey everybody, how you doing? I am back for the afternoon session, the last hour before we close today and the first hour of the aftermarket. How you doing one and all? Welcome back to Stock Markets with Bruce. Today. It's your uncle Bruce here and it's good to see you all. I hope you're having a good day today, Monday here in Creston. Oh, it's gorgeous, sunny, fantastic. We are uh, at 46 degrees getting for 54. That's our high to temperature here today, tomorrow, sunny and 61. Woohoo! 61 degrees. That is golfing weather in shorts around here. Let me tell you, unfortunately, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we get in rain, unfortunately, back into the 50s and 40s. But it is what it is. Uh, it's coming. We're coming out of it. The winter uh, doldrums and the, uh, the darkness of winter, we're leaving it behind. We're getting longer days now. We're over 12 hours a day of sunshine, almost 13 hours a day now. That is Fab you lust, and we are loving it. So thank you all for catching up with your Uncle Bruce again for this afternoon show. What is happening out there? Uh, GameStop, 183.86. It is off 7.59 on the day. Volume on GameStop has now been 12,800,000 shares. Very, actually quite a quiet, not stupid, hectic, hectic not dead quiet, but kind of yeah, uh, mediocre. Uh, low today, 165, about 15, 20 minutes into the opening is where we bottomed out at that number. And then we did a V recovery right back up. And uh, we began to uh, recover into this, uh, oh, we were in this one uh, 176 range. We got into the 180 range about an hour later. Uh, then we were hanging around the 185 neighborhood. And a half an hour later, we topped out at 195. Ever so briefly, um, around 11.30 this morning Eastern time, and then we gave it up to uh, uh, hit a, a, another low level of, of 180.26 or so, around that 180 level, just before 1 o'clock Eastern. And since then, we've inched our way back into the 185 range, 82 range, now 83, 84 range. That's kind of where we're at right now. Flatlining the last, uh, oh, two hours or so. The question will be, will the shares go higher towards the end of the day, hold on to this level, or, or give some ground up? I don't know if the company has raised any money today. They did a, a series of releases this morning. They talked about their their first, I think, nine weeks of sales, um, February. Um, outdid a year ago February, and that's probably the most significant financial number we've had because we know that in the last quarter, of the company's year end that ended in January, they made a profit. They outdid the quarter uh, from before. Their numbers were higher, and they were kind of shooting about two plus billion dollars in sales for that three month time frame. I think it's just a little over two billion. Uh, but for February, compared to a year ago, February, uh, the uh, the company is higher by over 5% in sales. Now, this is important because a year ago, February, they hadn't shut down any stores yet. This is the pre the last month of pre-pandemic to compare one to the other with. So they outdid last year's February sales by more than 5%. And you have to say why, and that's got to be the new Xbox and the Sony PlayStation 5 and all the accessories that you would sell with the new consoles even though they couldn't bring in as many as the sales uh, that they needed because there's a shortage of supply, especially on Sony's side regarding the chip shortage. Um, despite that, though, the company outdid sales by over 5%. And remember, they have 650 fewer stores worldwide than they had a year ago and still outdid sales by 5%. So that's showing you the strength of the probably... North American market, Canada, USA, very strong sales. And of course, we know that over a third of all the sales they have now are online sales. And it wouldn't be surprising to me that that number has gone even higher. And maybe that is where the growth is really coming from for these gross sales, coming from online sales, taking a bigger and bigger chunk of this company's direction. For March, 
March 2020, March 2021, 18% more for 2021. So th th there's a big difference. Why? Obviously, the stores were not being shut down. They're open this year versus last year being closed off. But um, fewer stores are running this year than before. And that online presence continues to become more and more dominant. So things are going in the right direction, I think, on the sales side for sure. And it's telling me that the company's gross revenues uh, could well be closer to nine billion for the for the fiscal year 2021 as opposed to the fiscal year 2020. And that would make it a higher gross sale number, I believe, than even 2019. Uh, because remember, for the last four or five years, every year the sales have slumped a little bit each year going down the line. This is a definite move up the other direction with fewer stores. And we want to keep that in mind. I think we're we're dealing with 14% fewer stores, and yet the sales are going to be higher than when they had 5,600 stores two years ago. Watch for that. Uh, the Cohenization of this company is continuing, and uh, it may already be showing itself on the bottom line already. And that will be interesting to see how the street as a whole reacts to this company's shares going down the line will wall street buy into the um, colonization of gamestop and the the new normal that we're going to get used to with with this company will they grow their sales 10 15 percent a year each year going forward even as they shut more and more of their stores down their gross numbers go higher their costs go lower their margins get bigger and will this company generate two dollars three dollars five dollars a share in profit uh, over the next two or three years. And if the street begins to believe that, wow, as an e-commerce player, these guys could make five, eight, ten $10 a share in profits down the line, uh, giving them a 50 to 60 time multiple, which is lower than most, that still puts them at three, four, 500 a share just on pure sales. Of course, the big news we're waiting for here is uh, immediately uh, at any time, what people uh which people are going to be nominated to the board of directors for gamestop there are eight directors leaving the company's board and there are eight openings whom uh, who are they uh who, who are who, who are going to be offered seats are i'm sure discussions have been ongoing for weeks behind the scenes off the record discussions and i'm very curious to see which particular individuals are going to be attracted to the board of directors of this company uh, their backgrounds, which companies they already are members of board of directors are already, what senior corporations or what senior positions in various corporations have they had in their career. There's a lot of um, pent up uh, interest, at least from this YouTuber. I am really curious to see who they are going to be able to attract and from what firms uh, going forward. This tells me a lot about the board of directors character, the company's uh, uh, objectives, uh, direction they want to head for. Uh, and I am looking for a strong uh, e-commerce led group of people that, you know, like Mr. Cohen, share the vision of the, the next five years where this economy is headed, where this world is headed. Uh, and I think GameStop will be at the forefront. I don't know if GameStop will have any kind of a relationship with uh, crypto. I don't know if cryptocurrency is going to be a um, very large uh, part of this company's immediate future. I could be, I could be surprised by uh, the kind of add-ons that might be made. There might be one or two people on the board that are very much towards that direction. And I will be curious to see just what kind of relationship they're thinking to have with crypto. Are they going to be in a position to want to accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment for uh, purchases of goods uh, or would even crypto be utilized as say uh, possible prize money for tournament play uh, when this company and I expect these guys to go into the e-gaming arena in a big way I, I can I'm trying to envision that possibility that there could be uh, local, regional, national, and global tournaments 
through the e-gaming systems where there might be uh, prizes offered of, of cryptocurrency uh, as the reward for participation and having a high placement. Uh, there's a lot of potential here. Um, there's a ton of direction this company can go. I'm still old school. I look at dollars in versus dollars out. Um, and I'm thinking going forward that this company will not be drowning in merchandise down the line like they may have in the past where with 5,600 stores around the world, once you've shipped product to these stores, you do not want product coming back to the warehouses from these guys. You want it going out the front door. And so better to discount the last few games or accessories that you might have in each store, each, each store up to 40, 50% off just to get rid of the stuff. Don't ship it back to us because we don't have relationships with our suppliers to send product back. This is the old game stuff. The future GameStop could well have inventory in its warehouse that is only there to be shipped out to final paying customers, but they may well have arrangements going forward where certain product doesn't sell up to a certain standard. Uh, they may have received in merchandise they don't have to pay for for at least 180 days, depending on sales. And if it doesn't sell in that 180 day window, they can ship it back at the cost to their supplier. This could be the new normal for GameStop where they are handling all kinds of merchandise on their on their website, but they've got very little of their actual capital at risk for the merchandise. It's now been shifted to the creator of the merchandise, the manufacturer. We'll see how this all wants to play out. I've talked to you before about how the company will be able to rent space, sell space on their website to uh, two manufacturers of certain product for cash uh, that I see as well. I see their website becoming uh, in effect uh, a digital platform for the company to make money from, let alone offer their followers an opportunity to buy merchandise through. So we'll watch for that. Now today uh, we are talking about this uh, three and a half million share, one billion dollar stock offering that's being bandied about. And I wanted to clarify to make sure all of you understand how this deal is actually going forward. The the uh, filing that was made with the Securities Exchange Commission that the, the company went forward with is they said, look, we're, we're not going to issue more than three and a half million shares and we're not going to raise more than a billion dollars on whatever it is we do going forward. Now, they've had on the on the shelf since December, so this would be now three, almost four months now, they've had the ability at their leisure to issue stock up to $100 million in cash, that, but they've not chosen to do it. They didn't, didn't, didn't do it in, in January when we were watching the stock go to four or 500 a share. They didn't do it when the stock reached 346 a share about two and a half weeks ago, and they haven't raised any capital at all by selling any stock. Now they're refiling a brand new filing and it might be an amended amendment or a brand new one, kill the old one, let's do a new one. $1 billion up to 3.5 million shares maximum on each front. Now, if they decide with Jefferies, their brokerage firm that they're using their banker, they're only gonna issue a million shares at uh, 184, right where they are right now, that's 184 million bucks. They could do that and shut it down and say, that's all we're doing. They don't have to be, they're not under no obligation to issue three and a half million shares. They're under no obligation to raise a billion. They have the right to go up to a billion and or up to three and a half million shares. But if they can raise a billion dollars by issuing only two million shares at an average of $500 a share, they could choose that option. It's a question of what does the market give them and what do they want to give the market? It's uh, sort of a back and forth thing. Now, this morning we traded a lot of stock in the first two hours of trading. There was a ton of trading going on. I would imagine that out of the entire, let's see, uh, uh, stock that we had go through here, 13 million today, I think we were at five or six million shares in the first couple of hours. And I've been wondering all morning, was it, was it possible that the company actually issued all three and a half million shares first thing this morning in the first two hours? Did they actually do that? Or have they issued any stock whatsoever? Have they not issued a single piece of share? Uh, not a single share. I'm hoping they haven't. 
I'm hoping they haven't sold any stock to anyone from the 3.5 million they could have issued. And the reason I'm saying that is I wanted this stock to get flushed out this morning with loose hands, with uh, hedge funds trying to create a panic and havoc and get people to shake them out, you know, shake out some stock. And with all of their uh, of efforts in the first hour, three hour or so, they got both 3 million out. And then over the next hour, another 3 million shares of trading came through and the stock came all the way up to this 185 range. And it was only down about seven, eight dollars a share by the time the shakeout had taken place. And the company hopefully didn't issue any shares whatsoever. Since this morning, the stock hit a high of 195 to be actually up on the day. And here we are now around the 194 neighborhood where we're down 750 a share. It would take very little volume to move this market into the 190, 195 range. Going forward now, if they come out uh, in the next couple of days with the first couple of potential directors, they start releasing names of directors, people who have uh, who've accepted the invitation to join the board. The stock could be quite active and re react very positively to these names coming up that are being referred, being released. Um, and we may find that the shares actually go to this 225, 250 range, 250 bucks a share range. And it might be there that the company begins to offer stock into the market without any fanfare, without any uh, notice, and they just start selling stock at 240 a share, 245, into the 250 range, if stock keeps going higher, they'll sell more. And maybe by the end of the week, uh, they'll have sold uh, a million shares into a market uh, with an average of 260 a share. And there's 260 million bucks in the, in the till waiting. And uh, they still have two and a half million they can sell whenever they want at whatever price they want. They bring out another couple of names for another few directors. The street likes this. There's a make maybe there's a Microsoft connection. Maybe there's a senior Wall Street connection. Who knows? Uh, why don't you just just end the suspense? I say. And why don't you just why don't you just announce that Elon Musk is going to be on the board of directors? Why don't we Why don't we just cut to the chase right now? Why don't we just end the suspense? And just mention casually, you know, do like a little a little press release, you know, 10 minutes after the close tonight, eh, Elon is, is on board. He's going to be on the board of directors. Then we can open up tomorrow at 350 a share. We can put an end to all the silliness and just get right to the bottom line. And that is this thing's going to the moon. How about, how about that? Why don't, we just, why don't we just do that? I like the simple, easy solution. Just rip the Band-Aid off, you know, tell us what it is. But uh, I digress. I could be a little ahead of myself. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I could be a little ahead of the company. You know, you know, even thought of that. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Whatever they want to do when they want to do it, uh, we'll see what's going on. It's possible tomorrow, day after tomorrow, the company makes a makes a filing and they go to the SEC and they say, "We sold three uh, three and a half million shares. We got one hundred seventy dollars for it. That's what we did." And they announced that they've raised 650 million bucks or whatever they raised on that issue. And that's the end of it. That's that's it. This issue is done. It's locked. It's finished. It's over. And uh, I'll be disappointed, but I'll forgive them because they've added another 650 million to the 650 million they got. Now they got 1.3 billion in cash. The debts are less than 300 million dollars. They're net positive a billion in cash. Um, and bring out your bring out the announcements of your of your directors. But I am hoping that there, the way it's going to go is uh, announcements of directors first, momentum into the stock second, and the issuance of stock from the treasury third. That's really what I'd like to see because these guys don't need six hundred million dollars this afternoon to pay a bill that's coming up. They don't have a bill they have to worry about. Um, they can take 90 days for all I'm concerned, for all I care to do what they need to do. But when they do it, they do it. And how they do it, they do it. It's up to them. That's their public company. It's not mine. I'm just going to comment to you on what I see. But I am very pleased to see the shares all afternoon sitting in this 180.85 neighborhood after having been down to 165 right off the bat this morning when the sky was supposedly falling because GameStop had the audacity to announce that they might issue 5% more shares into the market 
And this is going to be a calamity of gargantuan proportions when at the same time, We've been noticing for the last week and a half, AMC has announced that, well, not only did we quadruple the amount of shares outstanding from 107 to about 400 million, we're going to issue another 500 million shares into the street. And yet that stock went up a buck 70 this morning. Go, go figure. So it's funny how the market reacts from one stock to another stock. Um, it's the oddest, the oddest thing. I To me, this issuance of paper from the treasury is a is a nothing announcement it's it is so small and so little uh in the big picture of the big scheme of things i don't even know why it's even being mentioned uh in any prominent way but like i said i've been asking the company i've been begging them f since january why don't you guys take advantage of these prices that your stock is trading at versus where you used to be last summer at four dollars and 80 cents a share you're at $184. Uh, you know, you, you could raise a bunch of dough here if you so were inclined to do so. But three and a half million shares is not a lot of stock. And I, I forgive them for whatever they get for it. It's it's okay with me. Um, but if you were asking how to do it, I would give you my two bits worth of advice and take the slow road to China with this thing. Slowly feed stock out and don't get caught in the hype. That's how I would do it. But then I'm not involved in the brokerage business anymore. I'm a commentator hanging out with you guys to let you know what I see and what I feel and what's going on. Anyway, there you have it. Sometimes sometimes doing nothing is the right thing to do, and sometimes being patient is the prudent thing to do. But uh, I'm not Jeffries. I'm not the senior management of GameStop. I'm just a guy in front of his computer saying hello to all of his viewers going, how are you doing today? Are you any of you making money today? Are you happy with the Dow? I ask you. We're, you're up 383 points on the Dow Jones 30 today, a 1.1% gain. Over on the S&P, it's up 57.8 points today. That's a 1.4% gain today. And NASDAQ up 230 points today, a gain of 1.7%. Has NASDAQ had a couple of good days lately, like a, a good week or so? Uh, yeah, they have had a good week or so. And it is definitely apparent in some of the FANG stocks that I know a lot of you follow very, very closely. The FANG stocks have had a good run, and as has the Dow and the S&P 500. So lots of cash coming into the market, uh, picking up shares here. Uh, oil at 58.73. Uh, good news for you car drivers out there. The price of gas is going to go down, and that means... Your stimulus money does not have to go to the next tank of gas to get around town. Uh, you have more money for other things. And that's a good move for all businesses who are moving goods and services, especially as this economy is coming around. It shows you or shows me, I hope it shows you, that there is a ton of oil out there. There is no shortage of oil anywhere. Oil is available. Uh, it's plentiful. And the United States can turn on taps in all kinds of oil fields all over North America to drown itself in more oil if necessary. So no need for oil to go to 70 or 80 bucks a barrel. None whatsoever. We'll, we'll see how this uh, works out. 183.87 on GameStop, almost at 184. Um, we've seen it would be nice to see if it takes a little shot for us. Uh, maybe give us a nice closing run. We have uh, 37 minutes or so to go, or was that roughly? Yeah, 37 minutes to go before the day is done. And it's just around the 184 mark. AMC at $10.70, up $1.34. Um, it was sitting at 10.50 a few minutes ago. It popped up a little bit now to this 10.70 range. Good to see a, a stronger close for AMC. Uh, all of you out there that own the stock, you have to decide for yourselves what to do. I can't give you an opinion on it. I have not followed AMC like, like I follow GameStop, uh, but AMC is having a good day today, and kudos to them. 87 million traded on the AMC today. Very good. Over at Vector Acquisitions, one of the SPACs I follow, off 53 cents to 10.95. That Those shares have gone from the 12 range now down to the 11 range, and this is just getting to be a better and better deal as far as I'm concerned. VACQ is going to take over Rocket Lab. 
the company that sends satellites into space. It's a $4 billion merger with a $750 million kicker of cash. The minute that deal is listed as a rocket lab, um, I think they're going to do very well as a publicly traded company once their merger is completed. But it is at least 30 days away from finalizing. So you got to stick around for 30 more days. Have you got the patience to hang out? Hang in there. A NAF site holding sitting at 1001, unchanged on the day, a high of 1009, low of 1001. So it just hasn't been going anywhere today. Volume of 248,000. This is a satellite data company. That's what they're going to be doing as a public company. And every satellite around the world has data sent up to it and data sent down. And someone has to handle it. And that's where these guys come in. This is their primary business. SATA satellite data handling services and checks never bounce when you pay these guys for their services. You don't bounce checks to these guys because the minute you bounce a check, your data's cut off. You can't have that. You've got to have the data to flow around the world for your operations, whether you're in the car navigation business like SAT, like Tesla is or whether you're in the Visa, MasterCard, American Express moving money business, whether you're uh, governments moving data back and forth, you're the weather network, you're a television station, everybody needs satellites to be in business, including the Apples of the world, the Googles of the world, the Netflix of the world, everybody. These guys are going to just make a ton of money quietly, and it's not a sexy story. It's not like a James Bond kind of uh, satellite story. But these guys make the cash. And uh, you pick this up. I think you're going to be all right. IPOE, this is the company that's going to become SoFi. They're having a tough day today, down 48 cents on the stock, unfortunately. Uh, they're sitting at 1680 uh, That was a $10 SPAC. Uh, I say the cheaper this gets, the more you want it. Um, they're going to be closing their merger and that should be done i think within 10 days or less they're that close to finalizing their merger and uh, uh that one will be sexy that one will be a chock full of news public company you're going to hear all about sofi for years and years to come they're going to become their plan is to become the amazon of fintech of financial services on the net and you want to be watching this one very closely i'll be following all the details gore's holdings down 63 cents to 1347 uh matterport the 3d imaging company is coming in here this deal should be done in about 30 40 days and won't take much longer 1347 right now this stock has had quite the run as high as 28 dollars just after the announcement was made within a week of the announcement it went up to 28 bucks that gave all of us a little glimpse into the future of this stock. I, I think these shares will not be anywhere near here when this deal is finalized and Matterport starts releasing all of the news they're sitting on, deals they've been making, arrangements and licensing and everything else. I, I think we are in for a very active spring and summer with Matterport because that's what the name of that company will become once the merger is completed. Virgin Group Acquisition Corp, VGAC, uh, Richard Branson's deal, his SPAC, 23andMe is what it's going to be known as. $950 million cash in the bank. That stock right now is at uh, 1020 a share, unchanged today. This has been a bargain under $14. It is a steal down here at 1020 absolute steal. You got to decide when to make your move there. It's also within 30 days. And Starboard Value Acquisition SVAC sitting at 993 below the $10 mark. The deal of deals. The this company is taking over Sykstra, uh, Sykstra, which is C Y X T E R A, and their 61 data farms. Remember those satellites I was telling you about with the data going up and the data coming down. Guess where it comes from. And guess where the data goes when it comes from outer space? It goes here to Sykstra. 
These are the guys handling all your Netflix movies, all your airline reservations, all your purchases online, all the uh, YouTube stuff we're doing through data farms. These guys are so, so important to the entire mix. And I expect Starboard Value to systematically, upon their completion of their merger, they will systematically buy up all kinds of data farm operators all over the United States. There's, there's, there's companies with five of them, three of them, eight of them, 10 of them. They're going to buy a bunch of these guys up, merge them into their company and become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're going to do this globally. This isn't a U.S. based business. This isn't a Texas based business. This is an international organization. They will have data farms around the world talking to all those satellites up there and sharing information. It is an absolute necessity. If you're in any kind of business, you've got to have, and you're going to be dealing with the company that used to be known as Starboard Acquisitions. You're now going to be dealing with Sykstra, S-Y-X-T-E-R-A, $3.4 billion company today, much bigger than that tomorrow. And they'll have $650 million in cash the minute they're listed. And they will have cash available to them all they want. Every pension fund out there, every mutual fund out there will say, you guys need any money? You, you want to buy somebody? Let us know if you need any money. We'll, we'll buy more stock in your company and help you expand your footprint. Just just call. Just, just send, me, send me a text. Where be, I'll, I'll be there. Send me a text. And Fortress Value, $9.96, down 13 cents today. Fortress has had a good week or so. It had a little run last week into the 10, 13 range. It got out from under 10. It went back up over 10. Now it's back under 10 again. And Fortress Value, they're going to end up owning 860 therapy, physical therapy centers across the United States, ATI Physical Therapy, They've got 50 more under construction, and watch out. These guys are going to buy up all kinds of locally operated physical therapy centers all over the U.S. They're going to grab them, put them into this public company. All of the operators of these, of these 10 and 15 and 20 centers, they're all going to become shareholders of this publicly traded company. And these guys will be the number one dominant physical therapy company in america dealing with all of these insurance companies and if you injure yourself or you have a you have an operation on your ankle or you get a hip replacement and you need to go for physical physio you're going here you're going to one of these guys more than likely uh you're going to make this company richer as you get stronger and get your flexibility back and your mobility back this is what these guys are into it sounds boring but it isn't it is a cash cow company and uh, shareholders of these companies getting in now at these below ground floor prices i don't know how you can't make money these aren't ipos these are pre ipo prices and these companies will raise money on secondary offerings going forward at much higher prices per share than where they're trading at right now and you could be the beneficiary of the upside but that's just me i'm just an old guy talking about stocks that I like. Um, here is a list of Bruce's picks. Uh, if you want my opinion, what stocks do I like? There they are right there. I've always liked all of these, including GameStop, IBM, Microsoft, Intel, um, uh, HD, Cisco, uh, Apple, Facebook, uh, MU, Vanek Semiconductor Fund, SVAC, FAII, VACQ, NSH, IPOE. There's the current list of my of the picks that I like. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about why I like them. They're doing okay. Most of these are doing rather well. Some of them are on sale. And isn't that typical of most stocks? Not all stocks go straight up and all at the same time. They they take their they take their time when they go up. And when they, they go, they don't wait for you. If you're not on, on board when they go, too bad. You missed the boat. And you might find that some of these folks just... Uh, just leave you behind wondering what's going on. I missed it because uh, they don't wait. When, when their time comes, their time comes, you're in or you're off. And that's all she wrote. 
That is the deal. Uh, which SPAC is the satellite SPAC? There are two. There's the uh, vector acquisition, which is Rocket Lab that launches satellites. And then there's NSH, the NavSite Holdings, which is taking over Spire Global, which is the data information company managing the data on the satellites. They're the guys who operate them. That deal is a $1.6 billion deal with $475 million cash, and they're already busy. Uh, so there you go. Those are your, there are your, uh, your companies. You can, uh, you can uh, uh, check out the, uh, the uh, listing anytime you like and check them out yourself if you like. But uh, I will be on top of all of these SPACs. Every time they make an announcement, once they're publicly traded as the, as the merged company, I'll be following them just like I follow GameStop. So you'll be able to keep on top of those companies' affairs by just watching this channel here. And we will be busy with seven additional companies that I will be feeding you information on as these companies evolve into their new public corporations, for lack of a better word. A 183.73 on GameStop. The shares are uh, constantly uh, trading here. They're hanging in this neighborhood. Volume 13.2 million. The Dow is up 367, not giving up any of the gains that they've had today. They've really held most of the gains all across the day. S&P up 55, NASDAQ up 206. A ton of cash coming into the market because of the amount of cash that the stimulus program has released from the Treasury. This $1.9 trillion dollar uh, a stimu stimulus program it is so under it was underappreciated uh, but is not now it is now beginning to show the evidence we've only just begun to see the beginning of it it will take six months for this stimulus program to work its way through the entire economy this is only the first month we've only you only just started it if the uh, if the uh, uh, infrastructure deal can be brought through 2.3 trillion dollars if that can be brought through uh with additional funding behind that you are talking about a decade of job creation that america hasn't seen in an awful long time the uh, the gain for the american business community uh for this uh, trim uh, this uh, uh, infrastructure program is will be phenomenal it will be absolutely uh uh huge it'll take years to be fully appreciated It'll take several election cycles before you folks at home can actually say, oh, yeah, that that bill they put through back in 2021. Oh, yeah, I see what you, yeah, that's right. That is adding to our economy. It's adding regionally, locally, statewide, and nationally. When you offer um, uh, national highway systems major upgrades and you, uh, you uh, replace or repair major thoroughfares, including bridges, airports shipping ports the internet putting internet into a 5g format across the entire country it makes a difference and those of you who are working from home and are going to be working from home you want really want this uh, infrastructure program to go through because we're talking about the possibility of many of you in the next one year two years and three years you don't even know it yet but you're going to be thinking about this going forward. You might well, in the next few years, find yourself out of a job from that office job you used to have. And it's now been replaced with offers for your services remotely. And you might find headhunters coming after you because of your experience where headhunters are going to say, you know what, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, uh, we'd like you to work or consider working for a company, blah, blah, blah. They're based out of um, Chicago. They're based out of New York. They're based out of Buffalo. They're based out of Tampa. They're based out of San Diego. It doesn't matter where they're based from. And it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, they want you to do this for them wherever you want to live to do it. And it's a very good paying gig. You've got, you've got value you're bringing to the table. Uh, can we work a deal to hire you to work this contract? On a remote basis and all of a sudden you're going to realize oh my even 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 the two of us my wife and i we can now shift our existence somewhere else never thought this would happen to us but it is happening and we now can decide 
well, where do we want to live going forward? Do we want to leave where we are now and go to retire a retirement uh, location that we've always wanted to go to in 15 years from now or 20 years from now? We can go now. But do they have the 5G network? Do they have high-speed internet that I'm going to need to do this remote job that I'm being offered? That's why the infrastructure program is important, very important to you. This is going to bring up the U.S. from the electrical grid into the internet grid, everything else, much to a much higher level, and hopefully in a green, sustainable way, which will create gazillions of jobs. Just, just think of how many jobs are going to be created for uh, laborers to install solar panels, companies to create the switching systems and all the electronic systems to handle solar panels, the wind, the wind farm technology, and all of the uh, the uh, uh, grid updates, complete transformation of the U.S. power grid, and a complete upgrade of the U.S. internet system, uh, right into the mid 2020s and beyond, which will allow all of you out there freedom, if you want it, to either leave your cubicle, work from home, or work from a new home, or some of you, and I know that I've heard from you guys, you've been telling me, some of you might take this shot and go, you know what, I'm 50 years old. I'm selling everything. Getting an RV. I'm going to pull a fifth wheel behind my truck, or I'm going to grab a Class C or a Class A, and I'm going to see the USA and work from my mobile home going forward because I've got the booster on the roof that gives me internet access with this upgraded internet that's being designed and built, I can be mobile and I can work remotely. And if I'm going to be in Maine for two weeks in the summer and I'm going to be in uh, Florida for three months in the winter or in California or Arizona, <clears throat> wherever I'm going to be and everywhere in between, between spring, summer and fall, I'm going to see the USA I'm going to visit all 50 states and I'm going to take three years to five years to do it. It's not a race. It's just the new normal. It's in front of you and it might be exactly what you're looking for. We'll see, guys. Uh, Frankie, thank you for this donation. I appreciate it. Um, if you have not done one on one with Uncle Bruce, do it now. Uh, Frankie, thank you, buddy. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, we do have fun with the one-on-ones, any of you out there. Uh, Clayton Freeman. Clayton, you're the newest, you're the greatest member of this channel right now. You are number one. You're the number one guy. You're the most recent add-on. And I thank you for joining this group of uh, wonderful people. And uh, I hope you enjoy the group uh, as a member now instead of just an observer. I think it is fantastic. Anyway, there you have it. Um, Bruce, Peter Schiff is doing interviews and saying that they are going to have such a massive inflation problem that it's going to collapse the dollar and it will not be the world currency. What are your thoughts? Well, <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Uh, I have heard that story since the 1970s. Uh, the thinking was that the Japanese were going to take over everything in the 1970s. They got wiped out in World War II. They rebuilt their factories in the 1950s. They modernized them to top-notch standards in the 60s and 70s. They could produce a car, almost all of it, a big chunk of it, with robots before robots were even prevalent in the United States. Uh, the thinking was the Japanese are going to run it all. Take a look at the best cameras in the world, the best TVs in the world, the best appliances in the world. It was all Japan, Japan, Japan. And then something happened. Uh, even though the U.S. dollar dropped in value against the yen, it went way up. And even though America was, was rusting away with old car factories in Ohio and in Michigan and Indiana and Illinois, the, America was apparently dead in the water in the 70s and the 80s. It didn't die off at all, did it? Uh, America got smarter, and so did Japan. Japan figured out, what are we doing why are we building all these mega factories in Japan and hiring all these Japanese workers? We're, our currency is going up, which means the value of our goods, the cost of goods out of Japan are skyrocketing. You want to buy a Sony 
uh, Trinitron television, a 26 inch Trinitron. You're going to pay a lot more money than a, and then a television made in uh, Korea or in uh, Indonesia or somewhere else. The Japanese figured out we're going to build factories somewhere else. We're not going to have factories here. We're going to take factories and move them out of here, and we're going to set them up in other countries, and we'll produce our product at a much lower cost by exporting the cost of our labor. The Japanese actually went ahead and did that. They, they pushed for that. Where in America, it doesn't want to give up the factories. America doesn't want to give up the factories and have lower cost labor elsewhere. But... Uh, Japan is still a leading world-class economy. Now the, the question is, oh, the Chinese are going to take over. The Chinese, with all the factories and all of their billions of people, they're going to take over the world. You know what, folks? Uh, it's true. This thing right here, this little old, little old telephone that ma many of you have one of these, is not made in the United States. It's made in China. It's made by an American company, Apple, under license to a Chinese factory to be made there. Same thing with this thing right over here. These big-ass iPad, this big-ass iPad of mine, this is made overseas. Um, and yet, not the end of the world. Uh, we use them uh, for our productivity needs. We make money with these units, but Apple is the big winner. Apple charges us full retail price of this unit. This unit does not cost $1,000 to make in a factory in China. There's no way that's the deal. Apple makes a fortune on every one of these units, and we pay top dollar to get it, and it's a shtick. It's a shtick that is stuck, and we can't shake it. You never see this on sale 50% off anywhere because they only make enough to supply the market. And just as we get tired of it, they bring out a new one. They redesign it, and it's a fresh, a refresh, and we fall for it each and every time. God bless Apple. They employ a lot of Americans, but they employ a lot of Chinese, and they employ a lot of others around the world. Uh, the U.S. dollar is the king currency, baby. Uh, it's the one you can count on. Uh, when all chips are down and there's a military coup in some country somewhere, what is the currency of choice of the black marketeer? Is it the Chinese yuan? No. Is it the Japanese yen? Not, not really. It's the U.S. dollar, man. It's the U.S. dollar because the USA has got the democracy of democracies. As imperfect as it is, still number one. And uh, if you have a buddy, you want to have a friend around the world as a government, who do you want to be friends with the most? You want to be friends with the Americans. That's who you want to be friends with. You want Americans coming to your country and spending money. You want to be allowed to send your citizenry to America to go spend money and, to, and sightsee. It's America, baby. It's all about America. Canadians know that, oh, our dollar works. Oh, yeah, we, we can use our dollar. But we find that when we go overseas, we kind of like traveling with American dollars in our pockets, too, or at least the digital version of them in these. And we spend American money when we're overseas. Yeah, we use euros. Sure. And we're allowed to use our Canadian dollars in Europe. We can convert them over there. Oh, yeah, sure. No problem. But the greenback is what it's all about. And there is whatever Peter Schiff says, dream on. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the tougher times get, the worse times get. The, the, the inflationary, high interest rates, crazy oil prices, instability around the world. Everyone goes back to mama. <laughs> Who's mama? The American dollar is where we go back to. It's the greenback, man. That's the only currency that is the world currency. And Peter, you can talk all you want about fear mongering against America. It's not going to work. Not going to happen. But that's, again, just this old man talking with his 40 years experience. I thought 18% interest rates would upset the apple cart. Many economists thought, oh, European stability will eventually rule the day. The Swiss franc will be higher graded than the American dollar. The British pound will be higher graded than the American dollar. The Japanese yen and other currencies. It didn't happen. The oil crisis was for sure going to ruin America. Going to ruin it because those Americans in their 350 V8s, 
they're going to be in big trouble. As soon as gas hits a buck a gallon, America is done for. That was the talk in the 70s. Didn't happen. And the other talk was America's going to run out of oil. The Western world's going to run out of oil. <clears throat> there's, there's all the oil fields in Texas and Oklahoma. They're all going to go dry. It's all done for. Even Canada with Alberta, going to go dry. Oh, it's going to be heartache. It's going to be so bad. Are you kidding me? Uh, there is more oil sloshing around this country of Canada, the U.S., because we get we're smart. We're in, we're in we're in, we're inventive. We come up with alternative means of getting by. Americans invented solar panels. People, uh, maglev trains, American invention. Uh, being uh, able to convert a car into natural gas. American invention. Oh, my. Give me a break. Electric cars. Who's the number one maker of electric cars in the world? Where's that country? Where's that company headquartered? Right in California, the high tax state of California, the so-called impossible state to do business in California is home to Tesla. And that's where the factory started with electric cars. And all the superchargers were first put out in California, the most regulated state, anti-business state in the USA. That's where Tesla comes from. And now look at where Teslas are. They're going everywhere. And there's a Tesla factory in Shanghai. They're using American technology to produce electric cars there because they figured it out. They're not, they don't care about where it comes from. They want where the technology works from. And it's American know-how, American ingenuity and it's American drive, and it's American greed, the greed of Americans. And we have it in Canada, and it's in Europe. And there are greedy people everywhere, and we love it. We eat it up. The so-called purity, you know, pure people of the world go, oh, it's not nice to be greedy. Oh, give me a break. We got to make a buck to survive. Come on, people. We all want to be American in one way or another. You got to love the United States of America. What a great place. What great people, inventors, entrepreneurs, deal makers, risk takers. Yeah, got to love it. And man, would I love a Tesla. Sure. I would love a Tesla. You know what I love more than a Tesla? The kind of money it takes to buy a Tesla. That's what I want. Who doesn't? Who doesn't want to do well out there? Uh, this so-called goodbye to America, that is crap. It's pure bunk and not going to happen. Oh, man, I'll tell you guys. There's people out there who uh, just want to stir up the pot, haven't got, a, haven't got a fact to poop in. I don't know what to say. What can I say? What can I say? Please, please put up your SPACs again. Here's the stocks right here. The first two are SPACs. The bottom five are SPACs. Screenshot this screen. Screenshot the screen, and there are your stocks that are my faves. And if you're a member of this channel, you become a member of this channel, you will notice from time to time I will be adding stocks to that list. But you, as a member, will hear about it first. And that's my gift to you as a member of this channel. Join this channel as a member. You will get alerts from yours truly. There was an alert issued by me first thing this morning before we even went on the air talking about the GameStop financing. I didn't alert this morning to give my folks a head up. This is what we're going to talk about. You want to become a member of this channel for my stock picks. Next SPAC that I like or the next deal that I see come across my table that you should be aware of, you'll get a head start on the entire YouTube community because you're a member of this channel. It's my payback to you to trust me to be your host and i appreciate this very much and i thank you very much and uh, there's nothing i won't do to find the deal that you should be aware of will i get everyone no i'll miss some <laughs> it's just the way it is but we'll try to stay on top of these markets for you as best we can and uh, give you the best info we can okay guys thank you so much for being here um what's wrong with being an american nothing <laughs> what's what's great about being a canadian being a neighbor of america that's the best thing about being Canadian, just being being neighbors to these guys over here, uh, being welcomed with open arms when we come down to the United States. We Canadians, uh, some of us do not take for granted just uh, how a luxurious a thing we have 
We can drive there under normal conditions, of course. <clears throat> we can drive to the USA. We can pop into somebody's store, go into someone's restaurant and talk to them a little bit. And they ask you, where are you from? And you tell them you're from Canada and you go, oh, welcome to, welcome to Idaho. Welcome to Montana. Welcome to Nevada. I'm glad you came down here. We're, we're welcome with open arms wherever we go. How great is that? I mean, that is absolutely fantastic. The same is true when Americans come up here. We get Americans coming to Canada. We welcome Americans with open arms up here. We love Americans up here. Are you kidding me? We have so many. There are so many people who have friends on both sides of the border. I can tell you this last year, snowbirds have been dying. They have been just going through American withdrawal. So many Canadians were stuck up here for this past winter. Can't stand it. Wanted to be down there for the whole winter. Oh, friends and relatives. People have died, uh, old age and everything else. Uh, it has been a tough winter where we have lost friends on both sides that we never knew in 2019. We wouldn't see each other until 2022. Had no idea that that would ever be a possibility. Uh, so, yeah, we've been going through America withdrawal. So uh, that's why we love the Netflix. <laughs> we love the TV stations. What can I say? Thank you, everybody, so much for being here, uh, following me, uh, listening to this old guy rant away. Um, AB, I'm curious why Intel is one of your picks. Why? Why? Why do? You, what do? You, what is it with you and Intel? Nvidia, Apple, uh, TSMC are making moves such as ARM-based CPUs that take over mobile server desktop. I just like Intel. I I like the uh, the power of that company. I am convinced that as uh, uh, with the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, focus on chip technology. Uh, Intel will be one of the beneficiaries. Uh, I don't think Intel is going to have problems making a ton of money. Yeah, they're behind the curve in some cases, but all in all, I like the company long term, and that's that's why it's on there. Um, I, I just don't give up on it that easily. Um, other questions? Let's see here. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's go here. Thank you, everybody. A game back. Going back up on GameStop. One eighty four fifty one. I saw it at one eighty five a moment ago. Getting a little better. Uh, we're coming to the last four minutes of the day right now. Dow up 393, powering up at the close again. Uh, S&P up 60, Nasdaq up 233. Really good move on these markets. So I'm very pleased to see this. Thank you to someone has just joined us. JM, new member. Hey, buddy, you are the latest, greatest add-on to this channel, and I welcome you to the community. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining this channel today supporting this channel as you always do. We're getting close to the uh, end of the day here. The last three minutes of trading. GameStop, 184.22. Uh, uh, AMC at 10.61, up $1.25. That's a big gain for AMC. I hope it lasts. I really do. Um, the Dow, like I said, up 393 now for the Dow Jones Industrial. Uh, the high of the day today for the Dow was at uh, 33,617, 617. It's at 544, so only 70 odd points off the high of the day. Very good day for the Dow Jones. It's been a good week for the Dow, too. Uh, last week it was as low as uh, 32,945. It's now 33,500, so we're 600 points higher. We've had a good run on the Dow, and we're pleased to see it. I see it going higher. <clears throat> I don't see the Dow going lower. We're zeroing in, it looks like, on 185 for GameStop. We'll see if we can break over it. I don't know if we'll have a break-even day today. I was kind of hoping we'd have an up day on GameStop, but considering all the turmoil first thing this morning with the stock down to 165 a share, not a bad recovery, practically $20 on the way back. For GameStop shares, uh, gotta I can't be complaining about that. Volume on GameStop today, 13.7 million shares is the volume on GameStop today. Uh, again, not a heavy day, but not the lightest of days either. So there, there you go. How, what can I say? Uh, let's see what we want to do, folks. Uh, thank you all of you for uh, for being here and popping in, seeing me, uh, following me. We're gonna be on the air for another hour. As we go through the first hour of the aftermarket, watching the last one minute or so of the day go through here approximately, uh, getting ready for the bells to ring. 185 on GameStop right now, just touching that 185 level. Uh, let's see if there's any more upside to it. It might pop in the aftermarket. We'll follow that. Um, and there you have it. That's the, that's the story of the market today. Um, welcome all of you to the show, and God bless the United States of America. Way to go, USA. 
Um, where are we at here? Uh, thank you, those of you becoming su subscribers to this channel. Absolutely love it. Uh, we're starting to approach 106,000 again. That's kind of cool. It's been a while. We were at 106,500 about, what, two, three weeks ago, and then we got uh, we got hit with a wave of negativism, and we had to let, say goodbye to some people who just didn't want to be part of the show anymore, and now we're coming back on again. This is great. Love it. 185.54 on GameStop. Coming on a little bit further. We have 890 thumbs ups on this show. Thank you, everybody. We have 28 thumbs downs. Love the uh, the ratio between high and low. Fantastic. Keep those thumbs ups coming in, guys. And keep running that number ever so much higher. I love that. Appreciate it. Uh, we're coming into the last seconds. Are we going? The bell's going. There it is. 185.20. Let's take a look at the closing price of GameStop. 186.12. Final trade on GameStop. Kind of nice to see a little upsurge um, uh, at the end of the day. I, I kind of like that. A little upsurge at the end of the day. Um, down, I guess, 533 on the day uh, versus a drop at $1.21 worse than that. We were down 26 bucks a share on GameStop at one point today. And we have come back an awfully long way. So I'm very happy about that. Again, JM, thanks for becoming the latest, greatest follower of this channel. I appreciate it. This is good stuff, everybody. 186.95, someone is saying. Uh, love that. Uh, love these prices on one, on the stock. Um, um, and I just, I just think that this is still on sale. I still think the GameStop shares are on a serious discount to where they're headed. But you got to go through every day at a time, guys. One day at a time. You got to suffer through it. You got to pay your, you got to pay your dues. And uh, what can I say? What's going on? Uh, did we cover the new rule dropping tomorrow? I'm not sure if we've got that. Uh, I'm not sure which rule you're talking about. So many rules coming out. I'd like to see what that's all about. Great numbers today. Have a great rest of your Monday, everybody. Thanks, Hans, so much. Um, let's say uh, buy high and sell higher, I always say. There you go. <laughs> Oh, man. Any talk about April 16th? Um, not sure what April 16th is. What is April 16th? Kind of curious. What do you want to let me know about? A DTCC. Someone's asking about the DTCC. Are there DTCC rule changes coming up? Maybe. I'm um, not sure. I have been waiting for adjustments to the clearing systems. Um, and I'll tell you, people ask me, when do you know when those rules come through? When the shares take off, that's when you know the, the rules have come through. That's the easy way to figure out. Anyway, uh, Rabbit, fine, Bruce. I'll buy more GameStop. Gosh darn it, I'll just buy more. I've heard about April 16th as well, my sister's birthday. The day after the 15th, I've heard about that. I uh, made a real mistake selling PLBY when it dipped. Used the money to buy into IPOE, so hopefully we'll feel better soon. Um, let's see. Uh, the 186.95 close is, is uh, what the Fidelity folks are showing. Fair enough. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, what else is going on? Thank you, Carrie, for being here. I love it. Um, let's go. Um, any thoughts from Carrie? Any thoughts on how GameStop spikes and crashes early morning most days? Uh, you know, you get you get these, uh, uh, I don't know, pent-up sales, I guess, or pent-up buys. I don't know. Uh, I've always I've always observed the markets. In, historically, even in the 70s, uh, way back when, the first hour, hour and a half, a lot of activity would always take place, good or bad. And then the rest of the day, the market sort of reach a, either stay down or stay up or reach an equilibrium. Some stocks have a terrible opening and then fight their way back all day long. Others have a great opening and then a slump all the way down on the way back. Um, it just it just is what it is. Uh, the first uh, few hours of, of a, after a long weekend, can be very traumatic, can be very uh, active, uh, good or bad. Um, uh, and then, you know, sometimes during the week you get you get a couple of quiet sleeper days and then the, towards the end of the week all heck breaks loose and it just makes no sense. Welcome to the human emotion of a stock market. That's all this is. Uh, the buying and selling of shares has everything to do with human emotion, uh, People's greed, people's fears, people's boredom—it uh, it runs everything. Um, but the Dow, the S and P 500—they say here reached a record high today, 
on uh, outlook for the economy. Um, we got news Friday, of course, about the unemployment rate. Very good numbers. Um, we got news last week about Chewy. Very good numbers. Uh, but yet, uh, Chewy didn't double in price, did it? it? It didn't double the stock. But yet, the Chewy numbers came out very positively. You wonder sometimes how certain stocks react in a certain way on, on certain kinds of news, but they don't on other kinds of news. It is, it is funny how it... Uh, how it goes back and forth. The Chewy shares were sitting under $80 a share last week, around $76, $77. They reached uh, a, about $90 a share on the day of their announcement of, of bringing in all this money, making profits on the fourth quarter. And now the shares are at $80. Bucks. Uh, go figure how Chewy uh, you know, didn't go from $90 to $120 again. It, it didn't do it. Uh, this is how this market works sometimes. Uh, certain stocks will have a nice run in anticipation of good news. Then good news comes out and then they slump. That's what happened to Apple a few, uh, about what, a month and a half ago, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, Apple had been priced at this point of, to what I call perfection, hitting a high of 145.09 uh, back in around the uh, February, uh, late January, February timing. Uh, January the 25th, 142, and January 26th, 143 a share for Apple. And you can see with this chart right here, Apple hit this high level right here in the 142, 143 range, only to come down to this level down here, which was, if I recall, 116 a share. Uh, that's a drop of 20 something dollars a share on the world's leading company, the most loved stock in all hedge funds around the world. Why would it do that? They just announced record earnings when their stock hit that, just as they were hitting that high. It's because the stock got ahead of the company. That's all it was. The stock got ahead of the company. Analysts tried to pin it on interest rate fears. Oh, interest rates might go up. Inflation might go up. That's why they're selling Apple. No, that's not why they're selling Apple. They sold Apple down to 116 because people need to take a profit. There's been buying and buying and buying and buying into that stock and it got ahead of its potential profits. There was no way the stock would outdo the expectations of analysts by double. It's such a big company, it's impossible for that company to grow that, that quickly anymore. But the shares did get up to that level and they were trading at close to 40 times earnings. Uh, right now though, at 125.90 with a gain today of $2.90, the stock has gone up $9 from its 116 low and it's trading now at 34.1 times earnings. So it's not trading at 40, but it's trading at 34 times earnings, still up there. Uh, and it's still the big winner of all the winners out there. By the way, thank you, Keith Wilson, for becoming a member of this channel. You're the newest, greatest, latest member to become a, a person to become a member of this channel. I appreciate you being with me, and I'm glad you're here. Everyone's going to welcome you in here, man. You are going to be welcomed by everybody Welcome, Keith, uh, to this group. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm glad you're here, and I hope you enjoy it. Yep, stocks sometimes will go to what we call priced to perfection mode, making no sense. Other times, stocks will stay ahead of themselves for years, just years, and analysts will be confounded. They just can't understand why the loyalty is so deep. But there's something about the branding of the company, the, the style of the company, perhaps the entrepreneur running the company, that keeps the stock well above its fundamental pricing. Other times, no matter what they do, no matter how hard these companies work, they just can't get their stock to be ahead of their fundamentals. One is like one has been uh, was IBM for years. IBM could not get out of the funk of their market. They couldn't get out, couldn't get their stock ahead of their expectations. And the stock would be yielding huge money on the dividends, and that didn't do it. They started buying back their stock. That didn't do it. It just became so frustrating. But I will say in the last, well, three months, here's IBM for you. Three months ago, they were in this neighborhood here. They dropped down here, way down here, stayed here for a good month. This was in this uh, oh, 118 level, a 123 level. Didn't go anywhere. But finally, it broke out just in the last little while. Here's the run up. And now IBM is sitting at 135.79. Um, yet at that price, the yield on the dividend, you buy that stock for the dividend, 4.89% is your return 
holding IBM stock. You can't get that from a treasury bill. You can't get 4.89 from a bank. You can get a mortgage for less than 4.89%, can't you? You know around where you live, there are realtors who are out there advertising mortgage rates in the low threes. In Canada, we see mortgage rates in the low twos and the high ones. Under 2% for a 30-year or 25-year mortgage around here is not uncommon. Yet you buy IBM, you get 4.89% on your dividends every quarter. In other words, you can take a mortgage on your house at 2.5%. Take the money and buy IBM stock and get 4.89% from IBM and pocket the difference. Now, in certain countries, depending on where you live, when you borrow money to buy stock, you can write the interest off as an expense. And when you bring in dividend income, you can declare that as dividend income and you pay a much lower income tax rate on dividend money. So in reality, you pay 2.5% pre-tax to borrow the money. You get 4.89% on, on the dividend when you get the money. And your cost of, ta of the money is a deduction and the, t the revenue received from the, from the dividend is, is almost all kept. Very little of it is taxable. It's the perfect investment. And of course, it doesn't hurt that the stock went from the 120 range up to the 135 range already, and I think it'll continue to go higher. So sometimes these kinds of stocks, you can find them and you can benefit on a nice yield and start enjoying a capital gain at the same time. But other times, uh, these stocks don't react for years. They just spin off cash, but they don't go anywhere. Hopefully, with IBM and the new management running IBM, that will no longer be the problem. The company will continue to grow out and uh, will get much uh, more valuable as a, as a corporation, which will reflect in the stock price. And don't be surprised if every year at annual meeting time, IBM will raise the dividend. They'll just bump it up to keep the yield up nice and high because they're spinning off a lot of cash and they can afford to pay these generous dividends. If they don't have to buy back stock anymore, then they can use that money to increase the dividend. Therefore, giving pension funds, mutual funds, and ETFs and holders of the stock added income. And if you're a senior and you're looking for an income generation, you used to get it from GICs, four, five, six percent from GICs. You're not getting that now? Buy the IBM stock and take the uh, take the yield from IBM. Kind of a solid conservative company. Going to be around a while. I think you're going to be all right. There you go. 186.80 on the GameStop shares in the aftermarket. Uh, coming on a little, little bit more. Uh, the shares were in that 190 neighborhood on uh, Thursday evening. So they're about $4 away from where they were. And they're inching higher in the aftermarket right now. Just ever so little um, good sign. Uh, there you have it, folks. Uh, what, what can we say? Yeah, let's add Elon Musk to the board of directors of GameStop, Mark Cuban, uh, DFV, and we can go right to $10,000 a share. <laughs> I think we'll go up. Uh, I love my 15-year mortgage after nine years. There you go. Uh, right on. IBM has the capacity to positively on the manufacturing end to alleviate the global chip shortage now used in everything. Um, what else have we got? Home Depot. Home Depot has a very good dividend. That's true. And it, they just bumped it up. They just bumped their dividend up just last quarter. That is true. Uh, very interesting uh, um, uh, developments. A lot of interesting companies out there to follow. Uh, we'll see what's going on. I just bought that up, Bruce. Uh, the whole, if you had cash to buy a house, the Relix thing is to, would be to buy the house with cash, get a mortgage, invest in IBM, let the dividend pay your mortgage. Yeah, I just brought that up. That's definitely something you can do. Uh, you can use an asset to enhance another asset. There's another trick you guys can do. If you've got any room in your in Canada, if you've got room in your RRSP to maximize your contribution to your retirement, registered retirement savings plan, in the U.S., you have the ability to top up your retirement savings with cash. Uh, there's nothing wrong with borrowing money against real estate that you own, your own house. If you have a first mortgage, you can either bump up the first mortgage and add another 20, 30, 40,000, whatever you need. Throw that money into, in Canada's case, throw that into your RRSP and make a giant contribution to your RSP in one tax year. 
to bring your income way down. You'll get yourself a nice, big, fat, juicy refund from the government of Canada. You can use that money to pay down your mortgage. <laughs> it takes tax money to pay down your mortgage if you want. Or use it for any other debts you're carrying. If you've got some credit card debt, you've got an old car loan, you got a remnant of a student loan. When you get your refund from the government of Canada, pay off expensive debt and only carry the cheap mortgage debt. And now you've got this money inside your retirement, registered retirement plan, and it's growing inside the plan tax free for as many years as you keep it there. Now, whether you buy IBM with it, for example, or you buy in Canada, Royal Bank of Canada stock, or in the US you buy Goldman Sachs stock. If you're older and you're looking for a solid holding, you, you can buy that kind of stuff. If you're a bit younger, middle-aged, you wanna buy the ETF that I keep talking about, the global the global chip shortage, you wanna take advantage of that, then buy the S SMH uh, 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 ETF. Go ahead and grab that, the Vanek Vector Semiconductor Fund, um, inside your retirement plan uh, and grow it tax-free from there. Yes, uh, this is where you use assets that you're sitting on where you can borrow against them for cheap money and maximize your after-tax earnings by reducing the taxable uh, liable expenses you have. And in Canada, this is such a big opportunity. There's so many Canadians that can borrow money against their homes and top up their RRSPs because you have these lifetime uh, exceptions, the amounts that you can pop in for years and years of not making your maximum contributions. You can do them all in one year if you want. And if you're in this $80,000, $120,000 income bracket and you can put 50, 60 grand into your RSP in one shot and go from, say, 100,000 income to 40,000 income or from 80 to 20. Uh, you might not pay any tax for this entire year. All the tax you've paid for the last full you know, year, you'll get back as a full refund. That can be 25, 30,000 bucks coming back to you by making this one massive contribution to your RSP. You can take that money and just throw it into the RSP again for next year's contribution and stay maxed up if you want. Or you can, like I say, you can take this cash and just put it to where it's the most, what will take care of the most expensive interest payments you've got uh, and if you're carrying any credit card debt, which you shouldn't be, but if you are, knock that off, knock off a car loan, knock off a student loan, or just throw it against your mortgage or put it in the bank and have it as a little bit of a reserve in case you need it. All kinds of opportunities, all kinds of options, all kinds of ways to use assets you're sit currently sitting on and enhance your wealth. Nothing wrong with that. My interest rate, 2.75%. Absolutely. That sounds great. Uh, that is what you can do with assets you control. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of moving them about. Uh, you know, you might have investments in a brokerage house. Uh, you know, you got stocks and what have you in a brokerage firm. And now you have the ability to move the, uh, the, the money over to a, a retirement plan. Um, whatever dollars you throw into the retirement plan is, is a write-off against gross income. That's a good move. And the second thing is that it grows compounding now inside that plant tax-free all you were doing is shifting money from here to here this this is assets you have better to take advantage of what you've got and reduce your your tax liabilities right now absolutely best uh there you go uh thank you everybody what was the final close on gamestop well i'm showing 186.95 on my phone but i'm waiting for it to uh, give me the final uh close um, we'll see if that actually will hold or not. I'm showing another close of 186.13. So we're waiting for the final uh, uh, print, but it, it's in that neighborhood. Uh, uh, definitely better than the 165 this morning price we were looking at uh, right off the get-go within the first 20 minutes of the opening. That is what we saw. So we're, we're much better off now. All right. Uh, Skippy, are you having fun in London? Um, can, I need to move to Canada. Can I crash on your couch? <laughs> Uh, Skippy says the market closed at 186.95. John Van says thanks a lot. Um, and uh, uh, Skippy, Wally's World, yeah, how could I not be watching Uncle Bruce and chatting in the Discord server? Um, let's go here. Uh, great ideas, Bruce. Thank you, everybody. Uh, 186.80, 186.95, these final quotes. Um, what can I say? Uh, it's a beautiful thing, says Wally World. Uh, beautiful thing. Uh, there you have it. The Dow up 373.98. Not uh, not too shabby today. 
S&P up 58, NASDAQ up 225, oil down 267 to 58.78. That's where oil ended up with today, and that was the last of it. Um, Uncle Bruce, what's your, what is your favorite SPAC? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really have one of them that's my favorite of favorites. I, I like each one for its own unique uniqueness uh i'm i'm really impressed that all of these guys were able to raise additional cash over and above just the spac dollars that are in trust like that about all of these guys uh, this is uh, this is telling me that wall street money wants in wall street money wants to get involved with these private companies and it could have been that these private companies all at one time or another in the last year or so have had discussions with Wall Street brokerage firms, and they they just weren't um, offered the right deal that would work for them to do an IPO or, or anything like that. Or it could have been that they went to Wall Street and were looking for a, a sponsor to be taken public, but they couldn't find a sponsor. They found brokerage companies that were interested in them and liked what they were about, but didn't want to uh, uh, take the next step to do a, a public offering, an IPO. But because a SPAC was around, uh, there was the right SPAC at the right price in the right circumstance. The Wall Street people that they talked to said to them, here's an idea. Why don't you merge with this SPAC over here? They got $300 million in the bank in trust. We'll sweeten the pot. We'll find you $300 million more. You can go public with $600 million bucks, and it's a quick move, a very quick move. You don't have to worry about uh, a lot of outside factors. These SPACs will almost always close and you'll become listed in a 90 day time frame, and we will help fund you to a ton of money. Now that you're publicly traded with this, with this SPAC, you open up all kinds of possibilities to do mergers and other acquisitions. And that might be what some of these private companies have in mind. They want it to go public because they're trying to buy up their competitors in their regions, uh, in other parts of the country, they wanted to expand their business, but they didn't want to borrow money from private arranged banker scenarios. They wanted to do it through a public market way. And by taking on these SPACs and becoming a publicly traded company in one shot, they've now found the perfect combination of issuing stock from their treasury down the road, raising additional cash at higher prices on secondary financings down the road, perhaps going to the bond market, again, through the same brokerage firms that offer to you know, raise money through stock sales. They go to the bond department of that, of that investment bank, and now they can raise money issuing bonds at half a percentage point, one percentage point, two percentage point, where in the past they used to go to their local banker in their local area and say, yeah, we want to raise $5 million, $10 million, $20 million. And the banker would say, well, I can only lend you money at 8% interest or 6% interest. We, we, I can't give you a better deal than that. And these guys are going, this is ridiculous. Why can't we raise money like other companies can raise money? Why don't we go public then? And we'll do it that way. So if we'll raise money by selling stock, that's free interest. We just give up an equity position of our company. Or if we go in, into the bond market, why don't we do what uh, DraftKings did two weeks ago? DraftKings raised $1.1 billion at 0% interest. Zero. They're offering the bondholder to convert into common stock up to seven years from now at 40% higher than what the stock is trading at. In other words, around the $90 a share mark. This was a SPAC. DraftKings was a $10 SPAC merger deal. They're now doing fundraising where they're offering stock from their treasury at up to $90 a share through convertible bonds at zero interest. Where's that? How is that not free money? Is that a deal of deals for the company? It's a gorgeous deal for DraftKings. They might do a bunch of these offerings going forward, one after the other after the other. They may well, well might well raise a billion at a time for the next three or four years at zero interest. Why wouldn't you do that? Ford just announced that last week, apparently. Also, zero interest bond deal. Going to be interesting. See what's going on. Uh, what else is going on here, folks? Um, Thank you all of you for hanging around with me today. Um, having a great day. I hope you're doing all right. That's that's insane, says Jibra. That's insane. That's the market. And that's the possibility of these uh, SPACs, as I've been mentioning. These seven SPACs I'm telling you about, they could well go to the bond market 
And they might not be able to get away with a zero interest deal, but I bet you they can get 1% interest. And why don't you raise a billion bucks at 1% when inflation is what, three? This is free money, guy. This is negative 2% cost of money. Because if you've got a seven-year note that you have to mature out and you're offering the note holder to convert into your stock, uh, you don't even have to roll over the debt anymore. You're just issuing stock from your treasury. You got all this money up front for nothing. 1% interest. I mean, come on. That is negative money. Five years, seven years from now with inflation at 2 3% a year, you've been negative 2% for, for seven years on this billion-dollar loan. What a great opportunity this is uh, to expand your company and expand your reach. And you might not even have to issue uh, money to buy your competitors. You go to a competitor that is half your size, a quarter of your size, and you come up to them and say, uh, tell you what, uh, why don't you join us? And you run the southeast part of the country. We run the northeast part of the country. Uh, you'll become part of our overall company. We're trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Or we're trading on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. All of your employees can become shareholders of this public company through the stock option plan that we got going. Everybody's work, 10% uh, of your paycheck can be put into the stock option plan. We'll match it with 10% more. Everyone can become a shareholder of this company. Everyone's motivated to want this company to do well because the shares go up in value. Every employee gets richer. They'll never quit. You'll have such a low turnover. The cost of being in business goes down because people don't quit as often anymore. And you don't have to retrain people all the time. They never leave. It's fantastic. You've got a waiting list of people who want in as a company. Now you acquire a company in the Northwest. You acquire another company in the Southwest. You've become a regional player, uh, from a regional player to a national player. And your stock value just keeps going up and up and up and up. Everyone who buys into this deal makes more money. That's what it's all about, kids. That's why I'm recommending these guys. You're talking about getting in on the ground floor of these guys. You're not the last guy in. You're the first guy in. That's what you want to be. Very interesting. Um, what else is going on here? Uh, are you able to advise UK residents as expertly as you do Canada and US on a one-on-one -on -one basis? Well, all I'm able to do for my UK friends is uh, talk, you know, buy low, sell high. Uh, as far as taxable strategies, you have to talk to your local tax specialist. That's what all of you have to do, even in Canada. I don't profess to be a tax guy. Uh, I've been around a while to know some of the basics, but that's about it. But I can certainly talk to you about what can make sense to you and what you might have not thought of to do. Um, I can give you, um, you know, experience. Uh, I can, I can sort of bring out uh, a certain uh, uh, circumstances that I've seen in my lifestyle that the lifetime that other people have had to deal with, and that might be good for you. Uh, again, uh, you know. Uh, talking to, uh, in my opinion, uh, I was always under the impression that when you talk to an elder, you're getting free advice from someone who's been around a while. And they have, a, they have something you haven't got, and that is experience. And sometimes experience is, is, uh, is um, uh, priceless. It's absolutely priceless. Uh, and you might ask someone a simple question and get back a response that you weren't expecting. It, it, it is so out of left field coming back to you that you go, I never thought of that. I, I never I never knew I could do that. I had no idea I could do that. Uh, that is what experience can bring you because we've been through the wars, uh, all the different scenarios, the good, the bad, and everything else. We've seen it all. We've, I've seen I've seen 18 percent prime rate interest rates. <laughs> I've seen a gallon of gas go from uh, 30 cents a gallon to three dollars a gallon in a year. I've battled through that. Uh, we've seen inflation out of this world and back again. I've seen uh, just all kinds of stuff uh, in my lifetime that uh, I can share with you. And maybe my experience will help you. Maybe it won't. But uh, there's only one way to find out. Have a chat with Uncle Bruce and find out for yourself whether he can bring you something to, uh, to uh, you know, chew on, to think about. All righty. Can't wait for these stocks to hit $100 a share. There you go. Um, anyway, uh, thank you, everybody. Sweet, thank you for that comment. Appreciate that. Um, get your After Hours Group Fix chat right here, right now. Um, experience is what it's all about, guys. I mean, I remember being a broker 
uh, I went to the guys with the white hair. I went right to these guys and uh, uh, I wanted to get on their good side. And the first thing I had figured out was uh, when it was busy and their phones were ringing off the hook and I was walking to the coffee machine, I would grab their cup of coffee and go, you want one? And they'd go, yeah, yeah, because they were on the phone. And I'd bring them back their coffee. I knew exactly what they wanted in their coffee. I knew if they wanted cream or sugar or both because I paid attention to the details. And I'd bring the guy his coffee and you have a good day, sir. And then later in the day when it got quiet, I was welcome at that man's desk. Usually it was a male because back in the 70s, the senior brokers were all men. Nothing personal against the women, nothing. Um, and I would sit down with the guy and say, you got a minute? Oh, yeah, for you, I got I got five minutes for you. Yeah, because these other young punks over here, they they don't uh, they don't even want to deal with me. They don't want to talk to me. But, yeah, you you show respect. Uh, yeah, what do you what do you need, Bruce? What do you want to know? And I go, I want to know everything. <laughs> I want to know everything. I want to know everything that you've been through. And these guys would find it very flattering that a young guy would come to them and sit down with them and pick their brains because they would be sitting back going, these young guys are making mistakes and no one is training them properly. What's wrong with these guys? But they can't train them. They're too busy working with their clients. Uh, but I would pick the day, part of the day where the this individual would have five or 10 minutes of free time and he could sit back, put his feet on his desk and relax a little bit and just talk to this young guy a little bit. And uh, I would learn so much from these guys, incredible amounts of detail, priceless information that these other guys wouldn't know. They never asked. They never thought to ask and they would remain clueless. And a year or two later, I'd be further along in my career and they're still struggling behind me, not getting as far as I am because I'm using a roadmap of success. Here it is right here. I'm looking at a guy who is driving a Cadillac versus a Chevrolet. I'm looking at a guy who's wearing $1,000 suits instead of $200 Sears and Roebuck suits. I'm looking at a guy who's wearing $800 pair of shoes instead of the Kmart specials over here. I'm looking at a guy who takes his wife on a two-week beautiful holiday to Europe every year versus these guys going to the lake and getting hammered. I'm looking at success. It's right there. And all I have to do is, how you doing today? You got five minutes to have a chat and pick the brains and they're, it's free. It's available. I mean, what more do you want? I couldn't understand it, uh, how some of these guys didn't want to take the free advice. I Maybe ego. You know, maybe these young guys thought, well, I'm a university graduate. I, I've got a degree. I'm smart. Okay. All right. You don't respect this guy's degree from 30 years ago? Okay. <laughs> you don't expect the 35 years of experience? You don't respect the fact that the book that this broker is managing is worth millions and millions of dollars. This is 1979-80. Okay? It's worth today hundreds of millions of dollars of, of assets this guy's managing. He is handling some of the senior executives accounts in our hometown. Uh, I know when this guy goes for lunch with a client, they don't go to Denny's. <laughs> they go to the private, they go to the private club, the petroleum club, members only. They go to the, uh, they go to the chamber of commerce, members only there. They eat well and they, this broker makes a suggestion to this client. The client almost always says, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll, let's do that. The broker comes back after lunch, sits down, takes his jacket off, loosens his tie, and gets to work with his messages and what have you. He's looking after this client's needs later today and tomorrow. The transaction that he has now been authorized to do on behalf of this customer, it cost him $20 for the lunch, for, it, for the customer's lunch, his own lunch. 40 bucks. The commission that is re that is represented by that lunch is $800. <laughs> the broker earns half of that, $400. He just made a, an earning of $400 taking to a client to a nice lunch for 40 bucks. That's called investing in your business. That's what these that's what these guys were doing. And I'm watching and I'm learning. I'm going, I want to be this guy. I want to I want to be that guy. As a matter of fact, I want to be that guy's boss someday. I actually want to be his manager. That's the kind of guy I want to have working for me and with me. That's actually what I'm looking for. An office of these guys, not an office of these losers over here and these party boys. No, 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 no. 
I want to be with I want to be with these kinds of people, right? And these kinds of clients that these people have, because this can take a branch office to a level that is unbelievable. And as a branch manager, how did I used to get paid? You might want to ask yourself. How did branch managers get paid in the 70s and the 80s being a broker, brokerage manager? Normally, what we would have is if you had an office big enough with enough brokers, you weren't a broker yourself. But if you had a smaller boutique office of maybe 10 or 12 or 15 brokerage brokers, you would still be a broker yourself. You'd be a working manager. You'd be a stockbroker slash manager guy, and you'd have both sides of the book. But you'd have an assistant to help you with your clientele's needs when you're in the middle of a crisis with, with that office. But usually you would be offered a salary to come through the front door. That's the minimum. You'd be offered an expense account to take brokers out for lunch, clients out to lunch, um, other entities, uh, other people out to lunch, hosting uh, events. But you'd also be offered an override of the branch. And that would be a, a commission on the commission made by your guys, by your people. And... Uh, the key here is to have what we call producers in the office, because if you've got a successful enough office, you're making more money personally as a branch manager from the production of your, your salespeople than your salary brings in. The salary now is just chump change. It's just that it covers your nut at home. It covers your bills and your rent and your car payment and your insurance and all that stuff. The money that the, is coming to you from the firm, from the overrides that you're getting, that's what it's all about. And so as a branch manager, I would be motivated to try to find a way to get 20 guys and girls off their duffs and on the phones talking to their clients. Because the more you talk to your clients, the more ideas that are shared between broker and client. And you find out, you get to know your client very well. You understand that they have a brother that makes more money than this guy does. And you wanna get an introduction to the brother as well. You wanna find out the parents of this client. If, they're, if they have any uh, needs, are they being looked after? You wanna find out coworkers of this client. Have they got a broker that they're dealing with? Are they upset with their broker? Are they happy with the service they're getting? If you outservice, that you service this client to the nth degree, they start bragging about you. That's what happens. The clients brag to their friends and coworkers about how great their broker is. And the next thing you know, you get the phone call from your client saying, hey, listen, I got a buddy of mine. I was talking to him, I'm golfing with him on the weekend. I was telling him about what we were talking about last week. He wants to get in on that stock too. Can I have him talk to you? Why, of course. And now you're servicing the next guy and the next guy. I would get my people off their duffs and being proactive with their customers. In other words, you folks at home would be getting a call from your stockbroker asking you, how you doing? What's going on? What are you hearing out there? What are you following out there? Have you heard the story about GameStop? Have you heard about this stock? Have you heard about these SPACs? Have you heard about this? That's what I was doing with my sales reps to get them to talk to your clients because new clients come from existing clients. That's the best referral you can get as a, anyone. If you're a real estate agent, where do you get your next listing from? Possibly a former customer of yours, someone that you serviced and loves the work you did for them to either find them a house or help them sell their house. That's where your next listing is coming from. That's where your next buyer is coming from. They know someone who's a relative that's moving into town or they have a relative that has to move out of town or they're trying to sell their house. They want to sell their house and get another house or they've heard at the dinner table at Thanksgiving or at Easter, oh yeah, Mary and Jerry are, are, are sick of their home. They really want to make a change. Gee, do you think maybe if they could talk to a realtor who could advise them as to what to do? Maybe the realtor would come to their house and walk, do a walk around and go, you know what? If you could paint this living room, clean up this, uh, rip out this carpet and just put in some linoleum or, or a different floor, you would really spruce this house up with not a lot of money, a little bit of effort. In a couple of months from now, this house will be just perfect for listing. And I can get you more than what you think your house is worth. This is what people want to know. And they are prepared to deal with you in the real estate market, in the insurance market, in the brokerage market. It's the way it was when I was manager. So I tried to get my 25 people busier 
because the busier they got, I got overrides on all 20 of these guys. And if I could get them to improve their production by 10% over last month, this month, over last month, I got a raise. I got a raise every time they made more money. And they were happier when they made more money. And when they made more money, they were happier. And when they had more clients, they were happier. And when they got new clients, they'd be, I got a new client. They'd be happier. And they couldn't wait to get to the office the next day to get back at it because it was an exciting, momentous, momentum-filled place. That's what it was all about as a manager for me. It doesn't work that way anymore so much. It's not quite the same business anymore. But the same uh, overall... Um, Incentives, I guess, are there for depending on what business you're in and, and what kind of line you're going to take. Sometimes your success comes from motivating others to be more successful. And you got to figure out what's the magic formula that gets people motivated to be more successful for you. And that makes you more successful as an individual. But that's, um, that's an old man talking about old school stuff. Anyway, I hope you enjoy these little chats from time to time. I love the fact that you're here with me today. Uh, hope you're having a good day today. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, what's wrong with the, going to the lake and getting hammered? What, what's wrong with that? This type of thing never goes away. Uh, what can I say? Um, let's see. What else is coming on here? What other other comments? Thank you, brother. Uh, uh, much can be learned here. Yes, that's true. I think so. Um, let's see. Um, Uncle Bruce is the old school cool. Uh, Bruce, please write an anecdote book. It would be fun. Um, let's see, um, any thoughts, uh, comments, concerns on the recent surge in SPAC activity? You know, uh, SPACs are not going away. They're not going away. They're not going anywhere. They're going to be very prevalent, uh, but there will be winners and there'll be losers. Uh, the winners will be the kind of companies that, uh, the SPACs will have raised enough cash. They'll have a pretty good core of directors. They've got a background of, of public, public company experience, and they can attract the kind of private company that is on the edge of going public anyway. These are the ones you want to be into with SPACs. These are the kind of companies that can attract a lot more cash on top of the money sitting in trust with the SPAC. Those are the deals I like. I like the kind of SPACs when a, a private company merges with a public company like a SPAC where the brokerage community is saying, how about $5 billion in cash? And they go, no, 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 we only want 500 million right now. We don't need 5 billion at 10 bucks a share. We'll take 500 million on top of the three, 400 million over here. And then we'll talk to you guys in about six months at 50 bucks a share, 80 bucks a share, 100 bucks a share, down the road, 200 bucks a share. We'll do secondary financings there for billions. Yeah, down the road. Those are the specs that I like a lot. I want, I want to be the ground floor guy. And I want, want you, I would want you to be the ground floor guy to, to score. I don't buy any stocks, and so I have to I have to vicariously live through you to uh, to uh, see you do well. Anyway, thank you all of you for being here. I present I pre appreciate it very much. All right, um, let's see here. Um, real wisdom is recognizing when you're receiving it, internalizing it, and applying it. This has been real wisdom. Thanks, Bruce. You know, I used to watch. Uh, I always still do this. Uh, Excuse me. When I had a retail store, I used to watch for this. When my dad had a retail store, he taught me to watch for this. And when I was a broker, I would watch for this. Um, and I would watch my coworkers and watch for this. Um, how a person dresses says a lot. Um, their hair. Is their hair kempt? Do they keep it short? Um, shoes. Shoes say everything. Um an executive with a lousy pair of shoes, loser, <laughs> absolute loser. Unless they're a savant, they're a loser. Um, there were there were brokers that I uh, I had come into my office one joined my firm, and uh, they would give you know give me a call. So we set up an appointment, and I'd meet them wherever you know meet them at a bar, a restaurant, meet them in my office wherever. And it was their appearance. The first thing I had was the first impression. The first impression is everything you got. And I take a look at these guys, and instantly I could tell you whether this discussion was going to last very long or not. <laughs> it was incredible. It was a dead giveaway um, how they were camped, their clothing, their presentation, their professionalism, and then the maintenance of such. Um, I worked with a guy who was a, uh, an incredible salesman. He was incredible. 
and he was dressed unbelievably. He he have, he portrayed the image of a successful salesman, and he was, and he had a work ethic that also you know, really made it. The problem was that there were certain people that could get along with him and certain people that couldn't. And the guys that couldn't get along with him are the ones who just didn't share this work ethic that he had. And they just resented him or they just didn't like him or whatever it was. I don't know what it was. And I was at a brokerage firm. I had left my employer. Um, I had been at one firm and I wasn't happy and I left. I got stolen by another firm. And I was really in a funk. I was really disappointed. I, I, I was in, in kind of in the middle of my career. And it was just, I was just disappointed with, uh, with management from where I had been. And I had really sucked the life out of me because I just wasn't, um, I didn't see an upside where I was. So I went with this other house and I'd been there with, about, for, with them for about six months. And uh, it was a tough market. It was a really tough market. And we were really struggling to get through. And um, um, my manager came up to me one day and he said, I want to talk to you for just one on one. And I thought, yeah, sure. And he said to me, I need you to do me a favor. And I think this might be just what you're looking for. I said, well, what do you got? What do you got? He says, I want you to work with that guy over there. And he pointed over at the uh, that individual. And I said, uh, what do you want me to do? He says, I he is only operating at 40% capacity. This guy is a Ferrari and his engine is just not tuned up right. He's just he's having a tough time. He, he's not organized. If you two guys could get together, I think the two of you together can just make a ton of money together because you just need to work with this guy and, and fine tune him. And I think he'll welcome your, your skills because you're a broker's broker is what you are. He's, he's already telling me I'm a future manager. Um, and it'll be good for you and it'll be good for him. And the rest of this office will be blown away by what you two guys can do together. It's going to take you about three months to get this figured out because it, because he's a mess. He's an absolute, he's a genius salesman, but he's god awful when it comes to handling his desk and his his appointments and his scheduling. He's just all over the place and you got to settle him down. I said, all right, let me talk to him. So at the end of the, toward the end of the day, I said, uh, after the market today, I want to talk to you. You and I, you and I have to go out together for a bite to eat, like a little drink or something like that. He said, yeah, okay, okay. So the market came, closed, and then we went out and we got out of the office and got away from everybody. And I sat down with him and I said, I'll tell you why I'm here. <laughs> you and I have been put on notice. We're in trouble. <laughs> we have an opportunity to succeed or we have an opportunity to blow it and be out of here in like three months. We got 90 days to get our acts together. And that's what the manager is telling me without saying it. I read between the lines. You and I either make it or we break it. And I think we can do something here, but we've got to buy into the game plan. He says, what do you have in mind? Because I am having a hell of a time. I should be making more money, but it's just not working for me. I said, well, we're going to change things up. We're going to become a partnership. We're still going to have our own clients. You've got your clients. i got my clients. But we're going to be involved in the same kind of stocks. We're going to find stocks that we want to be involved with. And we're going to start synchronizing our schedules together. And I'm going to be there to help you with all these other calls you don't need. And you're going to help me with my side. I'm going to help you with your side. And we're going to become a team. And we're going to work together. And it's it's going to be a bit of a learning curve for the next few weeks. But by the time we get it done, we're going to figure it out. So what we ended up doing was we, we moved our desks together. And we were sharing the same quote machine. And I could hear him on every conversation because he's right beside me and he can hear me on all my conversations because he's right over there. And we began to synchronize our messaging and we began to follow the same stocks together and we became a unit. And when he went to the bathroom and his phone rang, I answered his phone. When I went to the bathroom and it rang, he answered my phone. And we began to know each client, each other's clients. And we were, we were synergized and, um, it worked. We, I was able to take this guy from uh, a mediocre performer in the, in the office to one of the top 10 percentile guys. He was quickly becoming a producer. And he took me from, from being nowhere right up into the middle range and higher. We together made each other a lot of money. We worked together for about a year and a half. And by the time I became, when I left the firm, I became a branch manager went back to the firm I came from as a branch manager, but I couldn't steal him with me. I couldn't get him, couldn't get him to leave. But nonetheless, 
the last three months we worked together, I made more money as a broker than I'd ever made before. He made more money as a broker than he'd ever made before. And the manager at the back of the room was going, okay, we got, I found the solution to the problem. I had two problems and now I've got a beautiful solution. And everyone around us, they, there was no cat calls. There were no snide comments about what we were doing. They were all going, wow, look at those guys. They figured it out. They're making a ton of money. And my buddy, my partner over there, he had clothing that was beyond my realm of capacity to understand. He had Italian fashion, Swiss fashion, French fashion. He, this guy was, he was a clothes horse, but he wore it well. And uh, uh, he looked at my shoes one day and he said, I don't know how you can walk in those things. And I, I had okay shoes, but this guy had top of the line handmade Swiss shoes. And I had had a pretty good month the month before. I had made some good money. And I told Jennifer, I said, I got to go to the Bali Shoe Company to buy up some nice pairs of shoes. And she said, it's about time you spent some money on yourself. And I went and I bought myself three pair of very expensive shoes. In those days, this would have been 1982. So uh, a pair of shoes you could have bought at Dax Shoes or... Uh, some of these, you know, well-known shoe stores. You could have bought a pair of shoes for forty-five dollars, fifty dollars. I come out of Bally's, eight hundred dollars poorer with three pairs of shoes. I dropped almost three hundred bucks a pair on brand new, really nice shoes, but they sure were nice. And I came in the next morning, and my buddy was sitting there, and he's talking away. And my phone rings, and I pick up my phone, and I casually just put my legs up on my table, with my shoes showing. And I could tell that right next, I could see out of the corner of my eye, my buddy over there going like this as he's talking to his customer and he's leaning forward towards my, where my shoes were. And he's going, yeah, I got to call you back, buddy. I, let me just get back to you. And he puts the phone down. He goes, what are those? <laughs> he said, well done, Mr. Frommert. Well done. Welcome to the party, pal. Oh, man, that those shoes. Yes, sir. And for three days in a row, I brought in a new pair of shoes every day, and he was, he was so impressed. And then he said to me, okay, this Friday after the close, you and me, we are going to my favorite clothier. I have a clothing, men's clothing store that I go to the most. He is closing the store just for us. It's just you and me, buddy. Two o'clock to three o'clock, no one is allowed into this place but you and I, and we get the staff at our beck and call. We're getting you some new suits. <laughs> and I went, all right, we got to get her done. And we went into this place and oh man, we're talking Italian, uh, high-end Italian clothing store, which I would never set foot in. Um, we come in there and uh, my buddy says, this is my partner and we got to get him, we got to get him dressed because he's a mess. <laughs> he's looking at my clothing going, oh yes, we've got to fix this guy up. And uh, first thing he says, everything in the store, 60% off for you guys. Just don't even look at the price. It's 60% off. So you're going to be, you're going to be. I walked out of there with three suits. I actually didn't walk out. I was measured up for three suits. <laughs> they had to be altered uh, to fit my frame at that point in time. And a few days later, they were all ready to go. And now we were the two best dressed guys in that office so we reflected our success in the way we were dressed and it sure felt nice it was awful nice wearing these really nice clothing units and the shoes yeah it was a whole different ball game so now when i went to visit a client i was better dressed than my customer my my client which is also a change but that helped me in my management career because going forward in my management career as the boss, I would take my guys and go, all right, <laughs> we got to get you cleaned up. And uh, I would take my boys for a, a little stroll and we'd get their shoes shined at the shoe shine stand. We'd go to the barber, get their hair cut and styled. Now you can go visit your client in the client's office. We had to do all these little things. And this is part of people management, just people management, presentation. These guys now felt better. They felt richer. They felt more successful because they looked more successful. And before they would leave the office, even for lunch or to go out for a coffee, I would send them into the bathroom. Make sure your hair is perfect. Make sure you look like a successful stockbroker. 
This is the image that you're portraying. You're representing this company, this firm. Everybody in this firm, we have to we have to elevate up against everybody else. We want customers out there to want to be clients of ours rather than the other way around. And so we had to change our entire philosophy and lift the game. And that's how it was in the 80s when you interacted with your client one on one. Different world today. It's all changed. What can I say? Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, the way it was and the way it really still is to a degree, uh, from time to time, you will run into someone and you'll go, oh, wow, that's a very successful looking person. Look how they handle themselves. Uh, yeah, it tells you everything. Jakin, Yakin, uh, thank you for becoming a member. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, but it's it's Jake with an N on it. Might be Yakin. Uh, thank you for becoming a member of this channel. Appreciate it very much, guys. Thank you all. Uh, Bali Shoes, uh, awesome and very expensive. Yeah, they were really nice. They were so good that I wore those shoes for about 15 years because when they would wear out, a shoe, I would go to a shoe repair guy and he'd take a look at these. Oh, yeah, I can fix these. <laughs> the first thing they'd say, oh, I can fix these. Uh, this is a Ferrari. I can repair these. Those Kmart shoes you're buying, I can't fix those Kmart shoes. You go back to Kmart and buy another pair of those garbage shoes from wherever they come from. But these shoes, uh, they, they are repairable and they'll look just like you bought them. And they're even more comfortable five years later because you've broken them in. Yeah, that was the best thing about a good quality pair of shoes. Absolutely the best. There you have it. Um, anyway, there you go. I still have mine after 30 years. Uh, there you have it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. We're just about done for today's show. Um, I appreciate all of you uh, seeing me and uh, popping in, pop by and and, uh, and uh, throw me a few hellos. Uh, what do you think about BMW? I had a BMW in 1979, and it was the neatest car. Oh, it was a dream car for me to get. Had it for five years. Haven't had a Beamer since, but uh, I remember those five years. Jen and I had that car. We were, uh, how old was I? I was 25, 24, 25 until I was about 30. Had that thing for about that five-year window, and oh, man, that was a nice car. Dapper Bruce. Yeah, it felt good. It felt good also as a manager going to manager meetings. I used to go to what are known as the independent, the, the Investment Dealers Association, the IDA of Canada. The Investment Dealers Association would have a weekly luncheon um, at a private club for just branch managers and vice presidents in the area where, where we were in Alberta, Calgary. And uh, I knew that I would be uh, amongst about 40 other managers. Um, and some of these guys were uh, 10 years older than me, 20 years older, 30 years older. I was the youngest guy in the room. I was about 27, 28 as manager. And I am wearing uh, clothing that is better than anyone in that room. <laughs> and I knew it. But I didn't come in like a prima donna. I just came in as a, a like, uh, you know, my usual self here. Um, I knew I looked good, but um, I didn't play it up. I let them see it and realize it. Um, but you you felt just more confident, you know, as an individual when, when you presented yourself. And I would present my firm in the best light I could as this young up and coming guy who was a branch manager, now a vice president of the region. And uh, I don't know, I'm earning my stripes. Some of these guys actually were managers when I tried to get into the business and, I, and they wouldn't hire me. There were a couple of guys in that room that, that had to say, I can't hire you, you know, for whatever reason. And now I'm an equal. Five years later, six years later, I'm an equal to these guys. Uh, and one of the two remembered me. The other guy didn't didn't remember that I I had applied for a job with this company, and he said no. But one of the guys said, I do remember you. And uh, I said, uh, I remember what you told me. And he said, I do too. He says, I told you that someone will hire you, and I will regret it. <laughs> I said, that's right. His office, his head office wouldn't let them hire me at the time. It's just the way it was. What can I say? Six foot four, so much available amongst Italians. You know, I was that four foot eight inch branch manager. Came in looking like Danny DeVito. <laughs> Bruce needs to make a movie about his life after he becomes a Netflix famous. Oh, my gosh. Do you have any pictures of from back then when you were that dressed? I'd love to see him. I'm, I'm sure we do, but I don't know where they are. Uh, they're somewhere in the house. Uh, these are photos that are now 40 years old. Oh, my gosh. What can I say? Um, Stock Marshall Bruce, you just honored your dad again with that story of helping people. I listened on Sunday during your one-on-one, -on -one and, and you share those same qualities. Just so refreshing. Yeah, our dads, man. Uh, some of us were lucky enough to have fathers 
that uh, helped us along the way uh, to turn us into men. Uh, not all of us. I know that. I know how, I know how fortunate I was. Uh, dress for the job you want, not for the job you got. There you go. That's right. I got five suits from Brook Brothers for $1,000 post-surgery to go back doing the $20 million, $29 billion balance sheet. I lasted six weeks and realized I was in worse pain than prior four years to walk again. Unbelievable. And sometimes life is not fair. This movement transcends politics. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for being here with me today. Uh, but for the shoes, uh, the shoes, I'm a female wizard. Laugh out loud. You got to look the part. Uh, pictures. We need pictures. Uh, I work on home. Good days. I wear pants. Gator skins, Bruce. I uh, didn't wear gator skin shoes. No, no, didn't wear gator skins. We had winter where we'd have salt on the streets and stuff. And, oh, I took so much care of my shoes. I was careful not to get salt water on them. If they if they ever got touched, I would go right to my shoe shine guy and say, save me. <laughs> they got wet. Uh, but uh, took took good care of my shoes as best as I could. I would definitely do that. Thank you, everybody, so much. Uh, Barney, Stinson, and Bruce. Uh, and uh, pretend you're a CFO of a private successful company. A few years, a decision may be made to go public, IPO, or SPAC. Uh, my Reebok pumps aren't good enough. What's that all about? Uh, I have a pair of Bali black cap toes. Uh, super, super comfortable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to listen to this hour of stock markets with Bruce and then uh, weekly until they become a millionaire. Thanks, Bruce. Brooks Brothers makes nice clothes for men. I repair them and still go with them. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Bruce, I may ask you, since you mentioned that your family has a background in retail, do you have any tips for a young business owner? Oh, gosh, yeah. Tons, tons, tons. Uh, I've, I've been involved in a lot of retail in my years. Uh, I've had a couple of other retail stores over the years. And, oh, man, uh, the same story applies. The same, uh, the, the, the things you did to be successful in the 60s are what you need to do today in retail. You still need to do the same thing. And some of these new kids just don't know it, don't get it. Great story. Thank you, guys. Uh, when are you going to open up that storybook? I love it when you do that. Will we see some new shoes tomorrow? I don't have very many pair left of the good stuff. Not many left. Um, man, oh man, those those some three hundred dollars shoes with inflation will be fourteen hundred today, and some of those shoes are a thousand today and more. Absolutely. Um, have a great afternoon, Bruce. Beamers were awesome sports bedans, sports sedans. Don't forget to hit thumbs up for Bruce. Thank you everybody for that. I appreciate it. Good shoes last a lifetime. That's right. They're a good investment in the long run. That is correct. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, oh my, all kinds of great comments. Thank you, old dirty uh cyan. Uh, thank you for becoming a member of this channel. We got another newbie here. Thank you very much for joining in. Uh, love it when new members come in here. Fantastic, uh, everybody. Thank you. Uh, uh let's see here. Mm, mm, mm. All those years in the Cayman Islands going to post office boxes in the LLC during the off offshoring. Uh, can't forget where we came from. Uh, that's right. Uh, let's go here. Happy to have a dad like that. Uh, I have tears in my eyes. Stop. <laughs> Wouldn't change a thing. Uh, let's see. I bought five suits for work, then got sent to work remote from home. <laughs> PJs that are. Uh, Bruce, can I use your stories on to, on to my dates? <laughs> I don't want to work. That's why I wear PJs all day. Oh my gosh. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Thank you, everybody. Father Guido, thank you, buddy for the donation today. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to get ready to go. We're, we're just about done. We're over the, a lot of time here. I grew up in retail. Story time with Bruce. Avengers Duncan, thanks, buddy. Thanks for reading my comment. Is there a way to send you a private message? Uh, just go to my email account. You got I got my email right here, uh, Bruce Vollmer at Hotmail.com. It's down below in the description. You can't miss it. You can always send me a private message there. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here today. Uh, make sure to see me tomorrow, one hour before the open. We're going to see what happens tomorrow. Um, we'll go, uh, we'll make some more money tomorrow. How about that? Watch the big short. All right. Big short. Uh, watch the big short last night. Thumbs up. Thanks for the recommendation. You got to watch that movie, guys. You got to watch that. You got to watch Margin Call. You got to watch all kinds of movies about business. Absolutely. We love Uncle Bruce. Thank you, guys. Have a good night, everybody. Absolutely. Have a pleasant evening, all. Thank you for being with me today. I appreciate it so much. Well, GameStop 187.12 uh, looks a little better. 187.63 looks all right. We'll see how it does tomorrow. We'll make more money then and uh, stay safe and healthy and get your vaccination when you can. 
and wear a mask when you go out there. Don't get sick on me. Don't you get sick on me, you guys. We've come all this way. Let's see what happens. Everybody get on Discord. See you there, guys. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with me. Last comment, uh, Bruce for life. Hasta luego, Tio Bruce. Thank you, guys. All right, that's it. I'm out of here. We'll see you tomorrow on this channel. Tell your friends. Make sure to subscribe. Hit the thumbs up if you can, and we'll catch you next time. I appreciate all of it. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. You skipped my super chat. I, I, I can I can only do so many. <laughs> they come by so fast. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye for now.